Welcome to Astronomy 103. In this chapter, we will cover the last parts of life of the stars and cover essentially neutron stars, black holes, and space time. At the end of the life of a massive star, we've seen the iron core collapses. When the core collapses, the electrons are pushed down into the nuclei. So the core collapses from the size of the Earth, which is roughly a white dwarf size, to the size of Milwaukee, about 20 kilometers, 13 miles in diameter. During this time, 100 times more energy is released in these few seconds than by the collapse than the star did over its entire lifetime. This creates a star known as a neutron star, a star which is composed of neutrons. The star is essentially a giant atomic nucleus. Neutron stars uh, was first theorized by Lev Landau. So immediately after the discovery of neutron was discovered in 1930, Lev Landau, a famous Russian physicist, picture shown right here, um, suggests the possibility that pressure in the cores of stars might push electrons into the proton and make a core entirely made of neutrons. He wasn't quite right. The pressure is only high enough when the star collapses. So if the electrons are pushed together with a proton, squeeze it, produce a neutron, release the neutrino as a result. So you go from the white dwarf, which is an iron core, which is essentially a white dwarf of the star, right? down to a neutron star, which is about 10 kilometers. It's not even done to scale, basically. Roughly 1 1,000, one, 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 one that's the size there. So it collapses by a factor of 1,000 in size and by volume by a factor of 1,000 cube, which is about a, million, a billion. So, so if you compress all of Mount Everest, pushing the electrons into the nuclei, you would get a single teaspoon of neutron star matter. All right, so most of Mount Everest is actually empty space. So there's Mount Everest, you collapse that, you get one teaspoon of material. So that one teaspoon of material weighs as much as Mount Everest. Okay, so the radius of these neutrons are about 10 kilometers, so about 6.2 miles. Uh, density is about 1 billion tons per teaspoon. All right, the mass is about 1.4 solar masses. And so the neutron star is essentially one giant atomic nuclei, made of entire neutrons, held by gravity, and supported by neutron pressure. Okay, and there it is, basically a neutron star, comparison to Milwaukee, there's like 10 kilometers around it. Okay, so um, let's talk about energy super. So uh, Walter Bay and Fritz Wicke point out that the gravitational energy released by a star falling inward to become a neutron star would be a 1 billion times as large as the energy emitted by the sun over the entire lifetime, which is roughly the observed energy of the super. It's actually a bit more than energy of supernova. So they found, they discovered this fact. Um, you see this is a old picture. He's smoking a cigarette right there, right? This is Walter Bay, Frank Zwicky, right? And so Bay and Zwicky suggested in 1933 that neutron stars might exist and might be the outcome of a supernova, right? But no neutron star was seen for the next 33 years, right? Finally, in 1966, uh, Sadowski guessed the very bright source of X-rays of the neutron star creating matter from a giant companion. But evidence is not compelling. So the real discovery came the following year, right? So a graduate student Jocelyn Bell using Anthony Hewitt's uh, radio antenna, which is just field wires, saw a set of mysterious real pulse sources that were that they call pulsars, because they saw from each object a pulse of radio waves once every second with extremely regular period. So what was Bell looking at? All right, so that's Jocelyn Bell, about the time she does get first, first neutron star. Uh, a sad note, her discovery won the Nobel Prize, but not for her, for her advisor. So one of the great mistakes in Nobel Prize history. Okay, so what she heard, she heard, she heard this regular pulse, this is PSR B0329 plus 54, it has a period of about a little less than a second, 0.7 seconds. So the pulse has happened with great regularity, about 0.7 seconds, so I can't turn this off. I guess not, oh, I can't not. So in fact, they didn't know what they were listening on initially, so they actually called it Little Green One One or LGM One. So it was soon realized that basically that these pulsating stars had to be neutron stars because anything larger than that rotating with a period of 1.3 seconds would just simply fly apart. Okay, so the radio waves are thought to be generated by intense rotating magnetic fields of neutron stars, essentially electric generated in space. For these so these star pulsing stars are called pulsars. The magnetic field is extremely strong, about 10 to 12 um, times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. 
So it's a trillion times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. Okay? And so as the north or south pole of the pulsar points toward us, we see a flash of radio emission. Okay, so there's the pulsar. Okay, there's a little picture of it. There's the neutron star rotating in the center. It's rotating here. The magnetic field is not the x axis, not the same axis as the rotation axis. So it spins around and you have that this cone, which basically goes in a different direction. If you're point if you're looking toward this cone as it's spinning around, basically every once every rotation period you see a pulse of radio waves. Okay, there is the pulsar in sort of more artist conception of it in action. Basically, you see the magnetic fields, and this cone of material basically rotates around. And if we are looking at it, every now and then the cone flashes us like a lighthouse. And so basically, we see pulses during this time. See, a pulse, a pulse, a pulse, a pulse. So the clinching argument that what we're seeing in neutron stars was this, right? So if you look at Recall in the last section we discussed the Crab supernova remnant, first seen by in uh, 1054, right? So this is a supernova, so it happened. And as you would expect to see, a pulse was discovered in the center. So after um, <coughs> watching it for a long period, about a year or so, the Crab cell was found to be less than a perfect regular cloud. It slows down consistently. And energy lost by spinning neutron is equal to the energy emitted by the Crab Nebula. So that was a clinching piece of evidence, the fact that in fact what we're seeing are neutron stars. Okay, so there is the Crab pulsar right there in the center. And um, so I'll say next is that pulsars come in a great variety. Okay, um, I wonder if we can lower this volume a little bit before we go to the next one. Okay. one was called a millisecond pulsar because the period was 1.5 millisecond but anything less than 10 millisecond period is usually called a millisecond pulsar okay now let's talk a little black holes right so the pressure um, from nuclear forces in the neutron star keeps the star from collapsing but there is a maximum pressure that nuclear forces can exert and beyond three times the mass of the sun no matter what gravity must win so at this point, the neutron will collapse to form a black hole, an object whose gravity is so strong that not even light can escape. So nothing can escape from a black hole, so how does this work? Right? Well, not quite nothing. We'll explain that later. Okay, Okay. so gravity is essentially an unstable force. For small concentration mass, the, ma the instability is masked by enormously larger short-range forces. But when density of matter is sufficiently large, or its mass sufficiently great, gravity becomes the dominant gravity and basically collapses is inevitable. So let's understand how stars, how normal gravity things work. If you have a build a large mountain on Earth and you throw things from the top down at various velocities, right? Most of the time it's gonna hit the Earth, right? But if you throw a large, large velocity, well, it will hit the Earth farther and further away. At some point at the velocity c, right, you hit you will basically go around and you hit yourself in the back of the head. Okay? Anything higher than that basically will will go around again and basically come back and hit yourself in the back head. But you throw it really, really hard, it'll actually escape and it'll go off to basically um, away from the Earth and never come back. So to escape from a star, you have to reach what's called the escape velocity. Okay, whoops, wrong way. So to escape from the surface of the Earth, never turn, you have to move of roughly about 11 kilometers a second, about seven miles a second. To escape from the sun, you have to move something close to 600 kilometers per second. To escape from the surface of the neutron star, you have to travel about 100,000 kilometers per second, basically one-third speed of light. So you add more and more mass to the neutron star, the escape velocity will eventually match and then exceed the speed of light. At that point, because nothing can exceed the speed of light, everything, including light, falls inward toward basically the central object called a black hole. So the region of space becomes black because light cannot escape, and thus a black hole is formed. Okay. Uh, the idea of black holes goes way back. Um, John Michel in 
1784, first suggested the existence of what's called black stars. So he supposed that light was uh, the gravity was so strong that all light emitted by a body would turn toward it by its own gravity. Okay, all right. Laplace also basically um, uh, came up with the, came up with some ideas that basically the attractive force of heaven could be so great that light also could not flow out of it. All right. So basically, it's essentially matter clumps of specks surrounded by empty space, right? So suppose you have this tiny speck here, then basically at the, some region around the speck, okay, uh, there's a region where basically the escape velocity from this imaginary surface exceeds the speed of light, and this is called the event horizon, right? So once you cross the event horizon, you cannot escape, right? There's no escaping, right? As you go for close and close the event horizon, it becomes more and more difficult to escape. So this boundary known as Weihar is essentially the surface of the black hole. All right. <coughs> okay. So basically outside of black hole, escape is still possible because the escape light is less than speed light. Inside black hole, nothing escaping. Okay. So a black hole is a region of space from which nothing can escape to the outside. The boundary of black hole is called the event horizon because events basically occurring inside the horizon cannot be seen from the outside. And after the star has collapsed to a black hole, it continues to collapse basically inside the black hole inside the spectrum. At least that's what we think it does. There's actually um, not that this part is actually not that well known. Alright. Okay, so basically imagine you collapse to a spec, there's my event horizon. Alright. So I'll, if black holes are black, how do we see them? Okay. Well, so in order to see them, the black hole has to basically be in a binary system of a companion star, right? That's close enough for some of the matter to be caught by the black hole. The matter will spiral in at close, close to the speed of light and gets heated up by enormous friction between different patches of matter and emits a very, very energetic radiation known as X-rays. So matter spiraling in, black, in the neutron star also emits X-rays. So how do we know look at black hole and not a neutron star? Well, Generally, from the energy of X-rays, we can conclude how fast the inflowing matter is flowing, moving, and conclude that it's actually caught by either a neutron star or a black hole. Right. So here it is, basically some material falling into a central black hole. Here, you cannot this thing is shown as black, but up in that point, you can actually see it because the light can escape, and this light actually gets hotter and hotter as it basically the light the material gets hotter and hotter, and so the lights get more and more energetic as you move closer and closer to the black hole up to the point of the event horizon. Here's the diagram of the same system. All right. So there are some sizable number of basically black hole um, black holes, right? Observed in the X-ray. This thing is X1, LMC X3, etc. etc. Okay. And these are typical solar mass of the black hole, anywhere from 7 to 14 or so, up to about 10. So you're looking about roughly about uh, 5 to 10 or so, right, for these uh, typical black holes, right? Okay. So just to give you an idea how to make sense of the name, so basically sickness stands for the sickness is the constellation sickness. X means it's solid X-rays, and it's basically the first X-ray source to discover. Same thing here, LMC, seen the large man in the clown, is X-ray source, third source basically seen in the sky ever. Okay. Now there are other numbers that are different. There's a A blah 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 and the two dash numbers. So these are coordinates in the celestial sphere. Okay. So there's a right ascension and declination. Right. And the letter A means it's from some aerial catalog X ray sources. Right. Uh, X N stands for X ray nova. Right. Just means the source has sudden increase in brightness. Has nothing to do with the old nova we talked about already in terms of nuclear explosion on the surface of the white dwarfs. Okay, let's close the discussion of space, time, and space time. Okay, let's re go back to the Galilean view of the universe. So, what is Galilean? The Galilean view of the universe was basically essentially the um, essential result from the Copernican revolution. So, let's say um, the Earth is curved because the curve up depends on where you are. Earth moves, right? And when events occur at the same place. Um, Events occur at the same place depending on how the observer is moving. Okay, as time is absolute, so you know what it means for two events to occur at the same time, and space is flat. Okay, now people knew back in the 19th century that light was an electromagnetic wave. 
Um, but in order, like all waves, that have to have a medium flow through, right? So the speed of light with them would be different depending on your motion relative to this absolute medium, right? So people spent many years trying to measure basically this medium, but what and what happened in order to measure the medium? Basically, you would move as you move through the medium at different speeds. You would measure different speeds of light, okay? And the way it works is that basically you just measure the speed of light in the summer and the winter because the Earth moves around the sun and one occasion moving at 30 kilometers in one direction, the other occasion moving 30 kilometers in the opposite direction, right? But all the experiments show that the speed of light was constant no matter what they did, right? So the equation to describe light say this explicitly, all right? Okay, but no one actually had to, no one made the giant conceptual leap until Einstein, right? So people actually knew this, right? If you write down equations, for electricity and magnetism, it says speed light is independent of basically how you observe it. Okay, all right. So they knew this, right? But they were still trying to measure this ether. Okay. So what Einstein did, he's turned out the following thought experiment. Right? Suppose you and a light beam are at some race, right? And your friend is watching you. So this is what your friend says: You're moving at 299,999 kilometers per second. Light is moving at 300 kilometers, 300,000 kilometers per second. Right, so what you your friend would say is that okay, the light beam is moving just one kilometer per second faster than you. Right, very reasonable. But here's what you see. Okay, you see the light beam moving at 300,000 300, kilometers per second. Now, this is what people observed. Okay, um, it is not the same because it's not like one kilometer per second versus 300,000. It's like maybe a difference of 30 kilometers per second or so. Right. So. What you see is you see light moving at 30,000 kilometers per second, right? Even though you're running at 299,000 kilometers per second. Um, so now you say, okay, fine. It's almost as if you're not moving. So at the end race, you and your friend compare notes, right? So your friend said you were fast. You almost had light being now just a, one kilometer per second faster. And what you would say, I was slow, right? It was as if I wasn't even moving, okay? So how can you both be right? Okay, well, the only way that's possible is if space and time are both relative and not absolute. Suppose you do this experiment again, but this time you're holding a ruler and a stopwatch. Uh, both of your friends can see. Now, this is what your friend sees. Okay, so that's your ruler, and that's your stopwatch, and that's your friend ruler and it, his and his stopwatch. And here's what you will notice. The first thing is that your, stop, your ruler is way shorter than your friend's ruler, even though it should be the same length. Okay, the second thing, which is hard to represent here is that if your friend watches the ticking on your clock, your clock takes absurdly slow, as if it was dipped in molasses or broken. But your friend's ruler stopwatch moves at the same speed. So when you measure how f a speed, what you're asking is how long did it take the light beam to move from basically one end of the ruler to the other end of the ruler? Okay, and how well how long did it take? So basically, at time t1, it starts at one end. At time t2, it ends at the other end. And you calculate the velocity by taking the distance and divide by time. So you're, you and your friend will both say light beam moves at c, but relative to your friend's ruler and stopwatch, and relative to your ruler and your stopwatch. Okay. Now what you say is that your friend say, will say that your ruler and your stopwatch is messed up. Your ruler is too short, and your stopwatch is essentially broken. And so that is essentially the meaning of relativity, that you and your friend will not be able to agree on the dis on the on the length, right? Okay, that time and space can only be made relative observer, and are not absolute quantities, right? So this is called the special theory of relativity, and the tenet of this special theory of relativity is the speed of light is the same to all observers. Earth is still curved. Up depends on where you are. Earth is moving. Space time is mixed up with one another and depends on the observer, but space time is still flat. Okay. Now, if Einstein had stopped there, okay, uh, so these are other famous physicists that this is, uh, I think this is Minkowski and this is Riemann, actually. They underline some of the mathematics for special relativity. Or, or no, I think it's well, Lorentz and Minkowski, sorry. Okay, so if Einstein stopped there, he would consider one of the greatest physics ever. But he didn't. He asked what this meant for laws of motion, right? So Newton said, if objects feel on force, they move in a straight line. So Einstein thought long and hard about this. He wondered 
if there was a hole in those way of thinking. So you perform what is another thought experiment. Suppose you're an elevator in outer space. Right? There's nothing nearby and you feel no forces acting on you. Well, what we say? Newton would say you will continue to move in a straight line. Now suppose you're in an elevator, but you're moving over and around the Earth. You, again, will feel no forces acting on you. Right? But Newton wouldn't say you're moving in a straight line. He'd say you're moving in a circular orbit. Okay? So what's the difference between number one and two? Right? There's no force in either number one or two, but somehow you, you have to know which law to obey. So what Einstein concludes is that both situations are equivalent. And this is known as equivalence principle, right? So to reconcile this limit, he had concluded in both situations, you must move in a straight line, but straight lines are not always straight. So that's the key idea, okay? So when is straight not straight? Okay, so let's imagine you have a beetle, right? We'll make a blind beetle, the beetle don't know which way it's going, and walks along a flat piece of paper. It only moves forward, but why it perceives a straight line? On a flat piece of paper, it'll, straight, it'll trace out a straight line, okay? Like this. There's my beetle, a flat piece of straight straight line. Now, if I work along a curved piece of paper, then it will move along what it thinks is a straight line. But in fact, it doesn't, right? If you zoom out, what you see is that it's moving along a curve, right? From your basically God's eye view. Okay? And if it's really curved, then essentially what will happen to the beetle will actually just move along and along in a circle. Right? So this is starting to look like an orbit. Okay, so this is Einstein's great triumph, right? So he realized his idea around 1908 to 1911, but it took him until 1915, and in fact, basically, um, just the few weeks before I had to deliver the lectures on this thing to actually finally work out all the math, right? Um, so what Einstein said is that it was can be written down as this equation, right? So there's a curvature part of space, and there's the mass and energy part, and so mass and energy curve space. So it's easy to write down, extremely hard to solve. Okay? So figuring this piece out, Einstein is considered the greatest physicist of all time. Okay? So here's general relativity. Earth is curved. Up depends on where you are. Earth is moving. Space time depends on the observer. And space time is curved. Okay? So any mass or energy warp space time. As we get to more mass and dense object, the curvature gets greater and greater. So that's the sun. A white door has larger curvature, neutron yet larger curvature. And black hole has so such a large curvature that in fact basically it generates what's known as the event horizon as we as we talked about earlier. Okay? So black holes are regions in space time that curve so strongly light cannot escape. So light travels in straight lines, but if you curve it so strongly that all straight lines basically lead back to itself, right? So that's the a, a sun, a sun, a neutron star, a neutron will bend more and more, and eventually black holes will actually bend all the light rays that emit from the surface back onto itself. So, what happens if you fall in a black hole? Now, there are only two spaces, places in a black hole that are special. The first place is the event horizon. The, the second space is actually this thing in the center, uh, which is the speck in the center, which is known as singularity. As you cross the event horizon, you may not even notice. It depends on how big the black hole is, right? Okay, small black hole, you would notice because well before, because you just ripped apart by the gravity. But if it's a really large black hole, the, the, what's called the tidal gravity is actually not so bad. And so you may not even notice that you went through the event horizon. Now the singularity is something you definitely wouldn't notice, right? Because there's a point of infinite density, right? So if you're, if you're not going to be ripped apart as you fall in the black hole, once you get hit by the singularity, you will definitely be destroyed. So here's basically a waterfall model of a black hole, right? So imagine you have some fish move at that can swim at some speed going down a waterfall, right? If as the water approaches the waterfall, it gets faster and faster, but the fish can only spin up to a certain speed. So once it basically moves at the point of no return, which is what's called the event horizon, it will fall in to be destroyed by the singularity, i.e. the waterfall, all right? Or if it comes out, if it basically can swim upstream before it hits this, the event horizon, then it will eventually it will be able to escape. Okay, so here's two crazy things, or not so perhaps not so crazy things about general relativity. The first is gravitational waves, and then we'll talk about Hawking radiation. So when Einstein derived the theory of general relativity, he found that the equation allowed for the existence of gravitational waves. So if gravity is the warping of space and time, then the gravitational waves are basically a warping of space-time that varies as a function of time. 
right? So how the gravity wave works. So if you move a mass of object up and down, it's just similar to um, um, electromagnetism, the information that the new position travels outward at 300,000 kilometers a second via the gravity. So if I move this object suddenly, basically one second away, then the gravity is modified basically um, uh, one light second away from this uh, object. If I keep moving, it's two light seconds away, all right, and so on. If I keep bending back and forth. So gravitational waves are super weak. So the only way to generate them is to take the most massive objects in the universe and move them as fast as humanly possible. So we see gravity expansion waves from neutron star black holes that are in a really tight and fast orbit. So here's one example. These are this is computer simulation, but there was also recently more dis discovered by LIGO. So as these gravitational waves get carried away, they carry away energy from the orbit of these two neutron stars. And as they go, they will get more and more squeezed up and generate hopefully something that looks pretty cool. Uh, spins fast. Now they're going to merge. All right. And should collapse the black hole. I'm not sure it's showing that. Yeah, I guess it does. All right. Okay. So the the most violent events in the universe, also most of it. So the merging of two black holes release the maximum energy possible, e equals mc squared, in the shortest time possible. The light takes the time it takes light to cross the black hole. But this energy is all in gravitational waves, right? So it's hard to see, right? Uh, we start seeing it recently because of LIGO. Um, oh, actually, this doesn't really work. Oh, it's too bad. Okay. So, <sighs> so I shall. So the gravitation should have recently been observed from these uh, systems, right? So now there's a worldwide effort to discover, discover this, and this was first discovered in uh, 2015, and now at this point in time, we have a number of these basic sources which are observed. So the U.S. Observatory is called LIGO, or Laser Interferometer interferometer gravitational wave observatory right and basically it's designed by basically placing two mirrors four kilometers apart so these are two arms there's one arm here the other arm you can't see here this is in hanford washington this is in livingston louisiana right the, the arms are uh, four kilometers away it bounces light back and forth to measure the alternate squeezing and and um expansion of space time that is that is a result of gravitational waves okay so we talk about how nothing escape, can escape black holes. So that is not completely true. This is only true in classical physics. When you take account quantum mechanics, the situation can be far stranger. Right? So in classical physics, space-time is just an empty canvas where nothing happens. But in quantum physics, space-time is alive. So particles are constantly popping out of the vacuum all right? and and, 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 and emerging and disappearing. So these are called, called virtual particles. The particles pop out. Right, like let's say electron, positron, and then they'll merge again and disappear again. Right. Okay. Now you can imagine what this quantum universe is teeming with these things that are constantly happening. So what happens when one of these happen close to the event horizon of black hole? So let's suppose you have like a uh, electron positron pair happens close to the event horizon. Then what can happen as they separate? The positron or electron can fall in, and the other part can escape. Right. And so. <coughs> Because you have some thing escaping, right? All right, this thing carries energy away, right? So, what does it carry energy away from? It must carry energy away from the black hole. And what's the only way to tap the energy black hole? Well, get some of the mass of the black hole because it escapes as Hawking radiation. And the way that works is that the piece that fell in is a negative energy term, right? It's a negative energy particle. So the escape member forms a part of a steady stream of particles that escape. This radiation is called Hawking radiation, right? So Stephen Hawking made the discovery back in the 1970s. The implication of the discovery is still being sorted out, right? So black holes will radiate, okay? And this radiation must come from the mass of black hole itself. And so because you're losing mass by Hawking radiation, this is known as black hole evaporation. So for a normal black hole, it takes a long time. So for instance, the black hole's mass of the sun takes about two times 10 to 67 years, right? So that's just not observable, okay? But the time gets shorter and shorter for small black holes, right? So if it gets sufficiently small, they can actually evaporate in less than the Asian universe. So as black holes lose mass Hawking radiation, they radiate more and more. 
So lower mass black hole radiate faster. So what? So they lose energy and mass faster and faster. So as it gets faster and faster, for black hole size of bus, it only lives about one second. They finally explode with energy about 9 times 10 to 21 watt seconds, about 100 times the, the world's nuclear weapons arsenal. So not really big on astronomical senses because it's only one ten thousandth of what the sun converts in energy every second. But it's big on human terms.